welcome to Ohio, <laughs> where we deal with daylight savings time. And about, I don't know, a week ago, we were talking about shorts and short sleeves. And here we are dealing with snow. So welcome to Ohio. Welcome to Worthington Christian Church this morning. We are glad that you are here. Um, in 2000, for Christmas, so 24 years ago, my grandpa gave me this book. And it's this book that uh, is for, from grandfathers to their grandchildren. So I was 12 years old at the time. My grandpa will turn 94 uh, this summer. He was born in 1930. And so he gave me this book that I would have these memories about him and know more about his life and some of the things that he went through as a child and even as adulthood. And I just want to uh, share with you some of the things that he wrote in this book um, that, that I, found, I found worth sharing this morning. So Again, he was born in 1930. He'll turn 94 this summer. Uh, this is something that he wrote. He had to fill in uh, the blank for some of these things. It says, the chores that I had to do. So, so think back to your childhood uh, chores. The chores I had to do. Go to the fields to bring in the cows to be milked. Clean up after them in the barn and feed the hogs. Now that is literally a stinky job on both ends, right? Carry water in from the pump about 50 yards from the house. <laughs> Carrying water from the pump 50 yards. Now, I don't know. You know how sometimes people get when they get older, they start embellishing stories a little bit. But 50 yards is a long way to carry some water. 50 yards from uh, the pump to the house. And then he shared some things in there that he wrote about me. Again, I was just 12 years old at the time. But uh, one of the things he wrote in here was talking about the day of my birth. Uh, born July 1st, 1988. Uh, he said Columbus, Ohio was actually born um, from, at St. Anne's Hospital here in Westerville. But this is what he said, the, the day, the first time that I held you in my arms. The first time I held you in my arms, I felt mom and dad are going to have a good ball player and a son who might become a minister someday. Now think about that. He gave this to me when I was 12. He hit the nail on the head. After about five years in the NFL, I went into the ministry. <laughs> no, he got about half of that right. Did become a minister. Um, another thing that he, he wrote in here that I just want to share is, uh, I thought this was really cool. Uh, one lesson I would like you to learn about faith. Mm. One lesson I'd like you to learn about faith. It is taking God at his word and acting upon it. That's deep. Taking God at his word and acting upon it. Believing, God, the things that you say about me, the things that you've placed on my heart, the things that you're saying that will take place in my life, the plan that you have for me, I trust that. I have faith in that. And then I'm going to act upon it. I'm going to take that step of faith. Man, that's deep. And then this line here, a real Christian. And then he got to describe that. A real Christian, he wrote a lot of things in there. He talked about someone who gives their life over to Jesus. But there's one line in there that he wrote that I think that will be fitting for uh, where we're going at in the scriptures this morning. A real Christian is one who leads a life of humility. Now, if you had to think about your life, what would you want people to know about your life? What's something that maybe you would want to pass on to others that you'd want them to know about life or, or you'd want them to know about the faith or something that, that you would want them to know, even if it's just about you? You know, we have this unique glimpse of Jesus doing something very similar. In the Gospel of John, there's four, uh, four Gospels. They're the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the Gospel of John, John writes about this, really this last encounter that Jesus has with those who are closest to him. The last eight chapters of the book of John are, are about the last few days of Jesus' life. In John chapter 13, we read that Jesus is gathering with his disciples and they're having their final meal together. And John records their final meal together and some of the things that Jesus says in this final meal to pass on to them. Now to help us understand what's taking place here, let's, let's talk about a few things. One, uh, what is the Passover? And two, who are the disciples? 
The disciples are Jesus' closest followers. His closest friends and followers, there, there are 12 disciples, and these 12 disciples left really what was familiar and comfortable to them to follow Jesus when Jesus said, come follow me. Some of them put their careers on hold. Some of them took extended time away from their family because they saw something different in Jesus. They saw something different in the way that Jesus taught, and, and Jesus performed miracles. Who else performs miracles? So it piqued their curiosity. They left the familiar, they left the comfortable to follow Jesus. And these 12 guys thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly ruler. They thought that Jesus was going to bring this this freedom from them from Rome, that Jesus was going to free them from the oppression of the Roman government and, and place this earthly reign. And they were wrong about that. Jesus is about to give a great example of what type of king he is. And leader he is. Now another thing to note about these 12 guys is these 12 guys, they're just ordinary dudes. They're a lot like you and I. A lot, a lot we read through the Gospels and say, okay, actually these guys aren't, aren't qualified to do the things that Jesus has asked them to do. There's ordinary people, ordinary tradesmen that Jesus comes to, to, to follow him and then Jesus is going to use these 12 ordinary guys to then be world changers. They've been following Jesus for three years of his ministry. Now Jesus is going to commission these 12 guys to take the good news into the entire world and to change the world. In Acts 1, right before Jesus ascends into heaven, the very last words that Jesus tells them is this in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You're going to take the good news to the ends of the earth. Now that's a big task. And these 12 guys with no formal training are going to be the ones that take news into the world that will change it forever. Now, they've been following Jesus for three years. They've been seeing his miracles. They've been uh, hearing his teachings. They've been watching how Jesus has interacted with people. They've been learning from on-the-spot type of training. And now at this meal, the task is near for them, and Jesus has one final lesson. This lesson will take place at what's called the Passover meal. The Passover meal was a culmination to this week-long Passover festival. And the Passover festival was this celebration that the Jewish community did every year to celebrate and remember that God freed them from Egyptian captivity. In the Old Testament, we read of Jews under the reign of Pharaoh in Egypt, and they were used as slaves in Egypt. In the Old Testament, read about how God used Moses to help free the Jews from Egyptian slavery. Now, there were several plagues that God used to, to help demonstrate his power and to help steer Pharaoh to release the Jews from slavery. And none of those plagues worked until the final one. In the final plague, God was going to bring about a deadly plague over all of Egypt. But God told the Jews... Then to take the blood of a lamb, and it had to be the blood of a perfect lamb, one without defect, to take the blood of the lamb and put the blood over their doorstep, over their, the outline of their door. And then on the night of this deadly plague, God would pass over the homes would had the blood of this perfect lamb over their doors and everyone inside would be saved. Where they were saved, they were freed from their slavery and each year the Jewish community celebrated the Passover festival to remember that special night that God saved them. Jesus and his disciples are having this meal, this Passover meal to celebrate the Passover. Little do they know that shortly after this meal, Jesus will be arrested. Jesus will be beaten. And then Jesus will be nailed to the cross where his blood will be poured out. In the Bible, Jesus is described as the, the perfect sacrificial lamb. And that's imagery going back to their exodus of Egypt. 
Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for all people, and his blood covers all of us just like the lamb's blood did there at the Passover. That's why Christians don't celebrate the Passover anymore. But we do remember Jesus' sacrifice in a very similar way. We do also remember and celebrate Jesus saving us in a meal. Lindsay just led us through that. And as we shared in communion, we took a meal together where we remembered that the bread represented Jesus' body broken and the cup represented Jesus' blood poured out for us. We remember that each week in a meal where we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Jesus and his disciples, they were at this Passover meal. And at this context is where we read that Jesus teaches this huge and final lesson. John 13, verse 1, this is what we read. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, it's important to note that Judas, the one who would betray Jesus, is at this meal. And as we remember that Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, is at this meal, it's going to make Jesus' lesson even more powerful. But let's think about what John just wrote. John wrote these words. The devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. The devil's work is real. The devil's work is to make us believe a lie that causes us to reject the blessing that God has given us for something that we think is better. That's how he works. Just like in the Garden of Eden, in the very beginning of the Bible, the devil made Adam and Eve believe that eating a piece of fruit was better than walking with God in the garden. They believed the lie and they ate the fruit. The devil's work is to make us believe that there is something out there that's better than the blessing that God has given us. The devil wants us to believe that other people have it better than we do. So we covet what other people have. We covet what they're doing and we begin to do things that will help us fill this void in our lives. We spend money that we don't have and and on things that don't fulfill. The devil wants us to believe that another person besides our spouse will fulfill us. So the devil tempts us with adultery and with lust. The devil wants us to believe that we aren't good enough. He wants us to believe that there is something about us that makes us lesser than the people beside us, lesser than other people. So we lose confidence in the person that God has created us to be And we turn to other things in our lives to help us cope with the feelings of self-doubt and self-worth. The devil's work is real, folks. We must reject the lies and lean into the truth that God values us, that God loves us, that God has created each of us very uniquely in his image. And Jesus is just about to illustrate this truth. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Let's pause there for a moment. This is deep. This is deep. Jesus had all of the power of God. Jesus came from heaven in the perfection of heaven and was returning to God in heaven. And here's the thing, Jesus knew it. Jesus knew all the power that he had. Jesus knew what was given to him. Yet he turned it away and became a part of humanity. About a week ago, I was driving down 23 here in the car with just uh, me and our five-year-old daughter, Evelyn. And it was a beautiful day, and we're driving down 23, and then out of the clear blue, Evelyn asked this question. She goes, Dada, I love it when she says that, Dada, have you ever seen God? That's a great question, isn't it? She said, Dada, when you were little, did you see God? I mean, what is she asking? 
Well, what does God look like? And how do I know when I've seen him? See, abstract thoughts for a five-year-old are difficult. So she wants to know, okay, what does God look like and can I see him? In the very next chapter, Jesus said this in John 14, 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. If we want to know what God looks like, we look at Jesus. Now, the, the moment of this meal was beginning to build. We know it's taking place in the context of the Passover. We know it's an intense meal. We know who's all at the meal, including Judas, the betrayer. And we know the power now that has been given to Jesus. And most importantly, Jesus knows all of these things as well. And this is what we read next. Verse 4, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, the king of kings, the one who had been given all the power of God in heaven, washed feet. Now, here's the context of the first century culture. Eating would take place on the floor. They would gather around on the floor in in a big circle and the food would be placed there on the floor. Um, And they would, we we see it in scripture, they say they would recline around the table. It's not like today where we pull up to a uh, table with some legs and we got our chairs and we scoot up to the table and uh, we got socks and shoes on and our feet are hidden. That's not how it is in the first century culture. Their feet are on the floor, and the way that they would recline with their knees to the side, most likely their feet would be close to the food. That sounds pretty appetizing, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but I'd have a hard time eating in that context of looking at other people's feet. Here's what they would do to help with that. As you would go into a house, whoever's house that you would enter in, the lowest servant of that house would wash your feet. It was expected that when you came in, the lowest servant would wash your feet so you wouldn't track dirt in the house. Now let's remember their mode of transportation. What did they do? How'd they get from place to place? They walked. So imagine how dirty, how stinky, how calloused their feet were. And you would walk into this home and then the lowest servant would wash your feet so that it would prevent the guests from being embarrassed around the table. And so they would have clean feet. And then we read this, that Jesus took off his clothes and wrapped a towel around his waist. Jesus is not only performing the act of a servant, Jesus is taking on the image of a servant as well. Jesus taking off his clothes, most likely just wearing a loincloth with a towel. Jesus fully exposed. The master, the teacher, the one who had the power of God takes off his clothes and washes feet. This is the final lesson for the disciples and a very important one as they would take the gospel into the entire world. Now, Jesus, what do we know about Jesus? Jesus came from glory, didn't he? He came from splendor. The king of kings came from the perfections of heaven, where everything had been given to him. Where he was, the, he was Lord, he was king. Jesus traded this crown and he picked up a towel and a basin, filled it with water, and he began to wash feet of all of his disciples, even the one who would betray him, who would later on trade Jesus up to be crucified by kissing him on the cheek. Jesus washes feet. If anyone should be served here, who should it be? It should be this. It should be Jesus. 
They should be the king, the, the rabbi, the Lord. He should be the one that's being served. Yet Jesus gives a lesson on humility and on servanthood. Jesus demonstrates what it truly means to serve others. He lays aside the crown and he picks up the towel and the basin. What do I need to lay aside to serve other people? Most likely, it's our pride. Here's what we know. Insecure people are not humble people. Insecure people are trapped by their pride. They focus on themselves and they sell a false image of who they are. They talk about themselves. They tell stories of themselves to make themselves look better than those around them and to elevate themselves above others. They're insecure about who they are and they don't even know it. Most of the time, insecure people are not self-aware. They don't know that they're insecure. And since they don't know that they're insecure, they are above serving other people because they might make them look lesser than they're, and they might, they might be embarrassed by taking on a role that wouldn't be lifting them up. And on the other hand, this is what we know, secure people are humble people. They don't portray a false image, they are secure. And the person God created them to be. And so there's nothing that they feel they must do to impress others. So they practice humility. People who are secure in who they are don't care what they look like when they serve other people. They don't care if it makes them look lower than others. They don't care if other people are lifted up instead of themselves. They don't believe the culture's lie that there's this certain status that people have to have that makes them feel important. They don't believe the culture's lie that there's this hierarchy that we often see in a, in a corporate structure where the people at the top are the most important and everybody below them has to serve the person at the top. No, secure people are humble people and they serve everyone. Instead of saying, I need you to do this for me, they say, how can I help you? They're people that look out for others and treat others the same way. They are secure in who they are in Christ. And since they are secure, they are humble. And here's what we know about humble people. Humble people serve people. Humble people look out for others. They look out for ways that they could serve others. Humble people put others above themselves. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians really sums up Jesus' life and sums up Jesus' servanthood and humility when he writes this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value other people above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He knew it. He knew he had the full power of God, but he put it aside. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus laid aside the crown to serve others. This was the final and the greatest lesson for the disciples. This was the thing that Jesus wanted the disciples to get because they were going to be commissioned to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. John finishes writing about this event. In verse 12, he said, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus is saying, okay, do, do you get it? Do you understand what's taking place here? Do, do you get the picture? Do you, do you understand what I'm asking of you? Do you understand what I, I am asking you to replicate into the world? Do you, do you actually get it? 
Do you understand what I'm doing? When Evelyn had asked me if I had ever seen God, I said to her, yes. It was a beautiful day. We were driving down 23 and we were getting close to high banks. And I said, yeah, I've, Evelyn, I see God in those clouds. I see God in the sun that's shining. I see God in the blue skies. I see God in those trees. It's like, Evelyn, I see God in what he has created. I see God in his creation, in his handiwork. I said, Evelyn, I see God in you. I see God in your smile. I see God in your laugh. And we had been talking with her teacher at the time, and she was encouraging us that Evelyn was was doing a great job in class, making sure that other people felt welcome, was bringing other people into to the circle when they needed to be. And I said, Evelyn, I see God in the way that, that you care about other people and the way that you treat your friends and the way that you love others. See, here's the lesson for the disciples and the lesson for us. When we serve, people will see God. I see God in the people in this room. I see God in the way that people intentionally look out for others they don't know and introduce themselves to make others feel welcome. I see God in people who lay aside their preferences so that it's easier for other people to connect with Jesus. I see God in the kids ministry teacher who serves each week and shares Jesus with little ones. I see God in the person who serves in the tech ministry and gives up several hours to serve in a way that people will never see. I see God in the person who will choose to worship at a different hour so that everyone has a seat. That's supposed to make you laugh. (laughs) I see God in the wife who cares for her husband with physical ailments. I see God in the single dad who loves and pursues his kids intentionally. I see God in the young adult who leads a small group of fourth and fifth graders. I see God in the person who finds a way to connect with and serve their neighbor. Here's the thing. If we want people to see God, we serve them. If we want to reach our neighbor, if we want the people around us to see the goodness of who God is, for the people around us to understand the grace of God and the love that has been given to us, we humble ourselves and we serve. We find unique ways to encourage others and lift other people up and value others above ourselves. If we want people to see God, we serve them. Have you ever seen God? I hope so. Because God sees you. See the towel in the basin that Jesus picked up at this meal and he washed their feet. It was just foreshadowing for the way that Jesus would ultimately serve us. Right after this meal, when Jesus was arrested, when he was held on trial unjustly, when he was beaten and nailed to the cross, Jesus laid aside his crown, his power for the cross because he sees us, because he loves us, because he serves us. He would serve as the replacement for our sins to bring us back into relationship with God. Jesus sees us and he serves us. And I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. I don't know what type of struggles you might be experiencing, burdens you might be carrying, the angst on your heart, the pressure on your heart, but I do know this, Jesus sees you. Jesus sees your pain. Jesus sees you in your uncertainty. Jesus sees you in in your tears. Jesus hears your prayers. Jesus knows the desires of your heart. Jesus sees you. Jesus is near to us. And Jesus serves us. And for us to help other people see Jesus, we take on the form of Jesus and we serve others. 
Father, we thank you so much that from the very beginning, in the, in the very beginning of the Bible, you wanted to be in relationship with us. From the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the corrections you made right there in the garden to be a replacement, to, to be in relationship with them, to the exodus and the, the lamb of the perfect blood over the doorstep of the house and over the doorframe of the house all the way to the New Testament with the blood of Jesus that covers us all. Lord, we are thankful that you see us in our need, that you are near to us. And Lord, you have served us in a way that we couldn't have imagined by giving up your one and only son who laid aside the crown for the cross. Lord, our hearts were full of gratitude for that. And our prayer is this, Lord, that as we carry your name to the ends of the earth, as we fill out the commission that you have given us, that we serve other people in a unique way that helps them see you. That is our prayer, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.